Mr. Timothy Kamuzuki, who is Executive Director of Amizu Eco Care and is a former lecturer of Ecology, Environmental Education in the School of Education at the University of Zambia. And we shall be talking about how you and I can help in combating the high deforestation rate. And um, you are listening out, you can call us on 0770 347 221. 0770 0347 or drop us a comment on our Facebook page. So do look for ZMBC Radio 2 and uh, drop your comments there. Good morning to you, um, Mr. Piri, and welcome to the Breakfast Show. Good morning. Thank you for having me on your show. Right. Um, can you tell us why should we protect our forests? The reason why we need to protect our forests is because as a nation we've been endowed with various natural resources. We've got uh, water resources, we've got land resources, we've got vegetation. These are just three examples I'll give. All these resources are interconnected. They are part of an ecosystem. And an ecosystem hangs in a delicate balance you notice that when we talk about balancing the ecosystem of the earth, vegetation plays an important role. As Zambia, we must protect our trees and forests because they supply us with various ecosystem services. They also supply the entire region and world with the ecosystem service of, of air. So if we plan to survive as humanity, if we plan to survive as a country, it's important that we take care of these trees. We are linked to them permanently. So the, the benefits are enormous that we, we get from these trees and it's important that we, we protect them. Now there's been, there's been some, some sudden talk about climate. There's been some sudden talk about issues of climate change. Is there cause, you know, for extreme worry, um, you know, from us? Yes, there is cause for extreme worry. Um, to understand the connections properly, maybe I need to explain what climate change is. When we talk about climate change, we're basically talking about the long-term change in the statistical distribution of weather patterns. You will notice that climate change is about climate and it's about weather. Weather is... The atmospheric conditions prevailing at any particular time it's short term and when we talk about these conditions we're talking about elements of weather such as sunshine humidity rainfall air pressure wind direction and temperature these elements of weather make up climate so climate is the collection of weather records over a long period of time which usually is between 30 to 45 years. So you notice that climate changes when there is a, f a permanent fluctuation in any of these elements of weather. The most pressing example of climate change that we're facing as a country is of course change in rainfall patterns. Right now we're talking about load shedding taking place the reason why we're having load shading is because of low water levels in the Kariba Dam and low water levels in the Zambezi and in many of the other water systems that we have in the country. So when climate change, when climate changes, there is an impact on us as human beings. The way we live is affected. Why are we having low water levels? it's directly linked to deforestation. When we look at ourselves as Zambia, if I can actually refer to statistics, we have a total of five, 50 million hectares of forest. These 50 million hectares of forest cover 66% of our land. So you will notice that when we talk about Southern Africa, Zambia is highly endowed with vegetation. You cannot compare us to Malawi, for example, Zimbabwe. In the region, we are really blessed with vegetation. 
Now what happens is, when we look at the deforestation rate, according to the United Nations and FAO, as of 2011, we had 167,000 hectares of trees being harvested in a year. If we try and look at what that rate is currently, the projections are we are currently at about 250 to 300,000 hectares being harvested each year. That's a lot of vegetation we're losing. Now, when you lose vegetation like that, what's the implication? The implication is that you have a disturbance in the hydrological cycle, or what we refer to as the rainfall cycle. We know it's called a cycle because it's a continuous secular process. You have vegetation evaporating from the water bodies and from the vegetation itself up into the atmosphere where it accumulates as clouds. When those clouds are saturated by moisture, the rain falls back to the ground and the cycle continues. So what happens is when you disturb the vegetation, when you reduce the quantities of vegetation, the amount of water that evaporates drastically reduces. When it reduces, you will have a change in rainfall patterns. The quantities will reduce and we're currently feeling that particular impact. The next way in which we are impacted is when we look at all the major river systems we have in Zambia, Kafue, Luangwa, Zambezi. Mm -hmm. Each one of them is protected by vegetation. There are actually forests that surround these rivers. These forests act as water catchment areas or river basin. You know, a, a basin literally is like something that holds water. Eh? That's how these forest areas also support river systems. So when you start harvesting the trees, you begin to reduce the volume of this basin, meaning it will collect lesser water, which it can pour into the streams and the, and the rivers. So you will notice when we talk about destruction of trees, we are actually also talking about destruction of the water systems that we have. So it's important that we do something to block this high rate of deforestation. Right. Now, Mr. Mr. Piri, um, there, are, there are two thoughts here. There are those that are advancing, um, you know, the climate, uh, you know, um, agenda like yourselves. And then there are also those that are advancing a development agenda, um, you know, to say we will not forego development purely because um, there are environmentalists that want us to keep these trees. Um, what would you like to say? Um, what is your comment um, with regards to that status quo? Uh, that's a, a very important question, Gordon. I think I'll start from the very beginning of what's referred to as sustainable development. In the year 1992, countries around the world met in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. They met to discuss the fact that the world seemed to be in peril because of various environmental issues and problems. As the world, it was agreed that we could not continue to develop the way we did before the year 1992. So they decided to come up with a solution. The solution was to push forward sustainable development, not just development. Whatever type of development you have has to be sustainable. What do we mean when we say it's sustainable? It means it should be the type of development that meets the needs of the current generation and also meets the needs of future generation. When you have a type of development that only meets the needs of the current generation or a few individuals or people, that is not in reality development because it's not sustainable. Within a space of time, the entire system collapses, will perish as a species of human beings. So sustainable development is what we should be promoting and not just development for the sake of development. Whatever type of development that we want to bring forth, we are supposed to find out what the positives are and what the negatives are. We carry out a simple cost-benefit 
analysis. So you have a global body that gave a suggestion and countries embraced this suggestion. Zambia embraced this suggestion. It came back to the people that attended the conference came back here and we had various documents promoting education for sustainable development. You will notice a lot of policies we have refer to education for sustainable development because sustainable development is not possible without changing the mindsets of people. And you can only change the mindsets of people through education. Now I know we live in a country where people look down on the profession of education. When you look at the youths, many of them do not want to become teachers. They pick careers that are seen to be prestigious. So we also have a responsibility to change this perception. Education is a profession that's not only noble, it's a calling. Why is it a calling? Because it's amongst the few professions that kills the mind of a person. When you look at professions like medicine, it's very important. If a doctor makes a mistake, you will instantly notice because the patient dies. When a teacher or educator makes a mistake, the mind is killed. You literally have a person that's walking dead. So we need to find a way of changing the mindsets of people and supporting systems that actually change the mindsets of people. That's a huge part in us achieving sustainable development. We also notice important documents like the National Development Plan, the latest, the seventh. You notice it refers to sustainable development, meaning it's, it's important. Literally every policy you look at has sustainable development and education for sustainable development mentioned. I'll mention a few environmental policies that refer to it, signifying its importance. We have, I'll go as far back as the year 1990, we have the EPPA Act, Environmental Protection and Pollution Control Act. You have principles associated with sustainable development and education for sustainable development in the National Environmental Plan of 1994. We move on to the National Policy on Environment of 2007. You will have ESD and sustainable development mentioned. We come to the Mother Environmental Policy, the EMA Act, Environmental Management Act of 2011. You will notice it continuously refers to sustainable development. Any activity you do, any type of development you are involved in, must respect the current generation and future generations. I'll also refer to other policies that are more recent, like the National Strategy to Reduce Deforestation and Forest Degradation. It refers to sustainable development. I'll refer to the National Policy on Climate Change, released in 2016 by the Ministry of National Development Planning and the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources and Environmental Protection at the time. It refers to sustainable development. So we cannot run away from respecting development that is good for us. So when we have development that is damaging to the environment, we are supposed to be the first to protest and I don't mean protesting in a bad way, literally raising our voices and saying, oh, it's, excuse me, what is going on? Right. Now, Mr. Piri, if the effects of climate change are so severe and then we're seeing some of it, you know, getting onto us at the moment, now, how much effort are we employing into mitigation as well as adaptation efforts? Um, is there any corresponding effort? There are various efforts being done by various stakeholders. You will notice when we talk about climate change, it's an environmental problem. And every environmental problem is, is complex and can be contested because you've got multiple stakeholders. So the government, of course, is playing its role. All these policies I'm, referred, I'm referring to are associated with the government backing them up. You've got technocrats in various government departments that are also contributing. You've got people in the civil society organizations, NGOs that are contributing. 
the only point I would like to mention is probably that we need to collaborate, you know, have some kind of synergy approach in terms of putting the efforts of every stakeholder together. When we talk about ourselves as individuals, we also have a role to play in solving this problem of climate change. So it's not just about looking to the government, it's not just about looking to NGOs. Each individual in their own capacity should find a way of contributing towards solving these environmental problems by changing their lifestyles. The moment each one of us does something, imagine the impact we're going to have as a collective group in the country. Right. You're listening to The Breakfast Show and um, mm -hmm. we are talking to Mr. Timothy Kamozupiri, who is the Executive Director of Amizu EcoCare and he is a former lecturer of uh, Ecology in Environmental Education in the School of Education at the University of Zambia. We're talking about how we can combat the high deforestation rate. Now, Mr. Piri, there's been talk about Forest 27 and 26 in Osaka, which have been degazetted. What is your expert view about this issue and can it bring us into perspective about but why experts like yourselves are opposed to developments in these forests? All right, first I need to clarify that point. Forest 26 was degazetted completely. A portion of it became what's known as the Mephes Project, Multi Facility Economic Zone. The other portion was retained as the Lusaka National Park. So, Forest 26 was completely degazetted. Forest 27 has been partially degazetted. That means portions of it have been subdivided for change of land use from the status of a protected area as forest to a developmental area in terms of residential developments or commercial development. So when we talk about Forest 27, we have to refer to three statutory instruments that are connected to the subdivisions. The first one being in 2017, statutory instrument number 62, 2018, statutory instrument number 59, 2019, statutory instrument number 13. When we look at these three subdivisions, we are saying portions of the forest are being subdivided and the use is being changed from forest to something else. The question I have to ask is this. Before independence, when these forests were being established and being tamed into protected areas, there was a reason why that was done. And the reason was because these places had certain environmental benefits. So now that we're deciding to reduce the size of this forest, are we saying those environmental benefits are no longer necessary? I think they are. Let's look at two benefits. The first benefit of Forest 27 is the fact that it acts as a catch, water catchment area or river basin for the Chalimbana River. The Chalimbana River is still there. Why should we then reduce the size of the forest by taking portions of it to become residential areas. Look at the size of Zambia. We only have a population of 16 million. Are you sure we can't find land elsewhere that can be used for these developments? Why exactly are we choosing to have these developments in a protected area? I think there is need for clarification on why we are developing in a protected area. This protected area protects the Chalimbana River. It also protects, the second reason, it protects the recharge zones for Lusaka. What are recharge zones? When we look at Lusaka, you will notice that the majority of it, just below the surface, there is a bedrock. That means when water falls as rain, the water cannot easily infiltrate and percolate through to the underground layers where we have the aquifer zone that stores underground water. It's in the aquifer zone that we get the water table. So because water cannot easily get to the aquifer zone, there are specific places in Lusaka where this water can be recharged into the aquifer zone. These are the ones I'm referring to as recharge zones. 
these recharge zones are protected, or should I say were protected by Forest 27, Forest 26, and Forest 55. Forest 55 is degazetted, it's gone. Forest 26 is degazetted, it's gone. Forest 27, more than half of it is already gone because of the subdivisions. So what happens to the recharge zones? If we destroy the recharge zones, it means the amount of water that gets to the aquifer layer underground will reduce. But notice that the population of Lusaka is increasing, meaning the demand for water and the rate at which we are pumping the water out of the ground is high. Yet we are reducing the rate at which it's supposed to recharge. Within a space of five to eight years, we will run out of this underground water. That's the biggest challenge that's coming before us. And I, I hope we can do something about it now. I'm predicting that within five to eight years, the biggest problem that we'll have as residents of Lusaka will be a shortage of underground water. There are people that will say, oh, it's not a problem. We'll continue to draw water from the Kafua River. We'll use pipes and bring it all the way to Lusaka. That is not a realistic solution. Because when you look at the water network system in Lusaka, not everyone is connected to that system. A lot of people have to depend on boreholes. But these boreholes, as we speak, are drying. Just ask any resident of Chalala, Nyumbayanga, Makene. Ask them the difference between the water levels from their hand pump or borehole 10 years ago and now. They will tell you there is a difference because the water table is rescinding due to the damage to the forests we are currently doing. If you do not protect the recharge zones, Mother Nature will not protect you by providing you with enough underground water. Right. Mr. Piri, um, what would you then like to tell the powers that be with regards to these developments in these protected areas? My advice, and I'm speaking as an environmentalist and as a citizen of Zambia. My advice is we need to sit down and revisit these projects. Why should we sit down and revisit these projects? I won't just speak from my own opinion. I want to refer to the documents I earlier talked to you about. When we look at the National Policy on the Environment 2007, under Environmental Impact Assessments, Audits and Monitoring, point number 714, objective number 7141, it states, and I quote, to develop a system and guidelines for environmental assessments including environmental impact assessments, initial environmental examination, audits, monitoring, and evaluation, so that adverse environmental impacts can be eliminated or mitigated and environmental benefits enhanced. That is 2007. This policy is enhanced in the EMA Act of 2011. And again, I quote, when we come to environmental impact assessments, a person shall not undertake any project that may have an effect on the environment without the written approval of the agency. Which agency are they referring to? ZEMA, Zambia Environmental Management Agency. A person shall not undertake any project that may have an effect on the environment without the written approval of the agency. It continues, and except in accordance with any conditions imposed on the approval. The laws say, before you bring about any type of project as a person, it says a person, it means any person. It doesn't matter whether you are white, black, yellow. It doesn't matter whether you are tall, short. It doesn't matter whether you are poor. 
rich, it doesn't matter. Any person that brings forth development has to make sure it is tested by an environmental impact assessment. We're talking about today. Apart from an EIA, there should also be a C carried out. Strategic Environmental Assessment. That's inclusive of the social impacts to people or communities in that particular area. Right. And Mr. P, as we close this discussion, um, what would you like to tell the public out there, and in this particular case, the residents of Lusaka, why should they add a voice uh, you know, to, to, to this matter? Uh, before I answer that one, I, I need to answer the last question. I didn't finish answering. Mm. My plea to the president, the father of our nation, my plea to all stakeholders, to all politicians is you, you have the power to reverse this. We can do the right thing. Going by what the laws state, the right thing would be to mitigate or curtail this developmental project, especially when we talk about the Kingsland project. It's a huge project, too big to take over such a huge chunk of Forest 27. I know there are portions of Forest 27 where we have the, the Zaf Twin Palm base. Where projects like that have already taken place, we can let them be. But let's bring in ways of monitoring the activity so that the levels of pollution into the area, and specifically the Chalimbana River, are looked at and acted upon. So we can do this as a nation. We, we can make the right decision for ourselves and future generations. That's my advice to the powers that be, and it's humble advice. I'm speaking as an environmentalist. To the rest of the Zambians, my advice is let us all play a role in trying to preserve and take care of the natural resources we have. We only have one country. We'll never have another one. We only have one world. We'll never have another one. There is no second chance if we mess up with these resources we have. Once we damage them, the consequences will be permanent. So let us as individuals find proactive ways to try and solve these problems we have. Let's find ways of engaging the leaders we have in our communities, our sections, our constituencies. Let's engage them and tell them why it's important for us to take certain actions in protecting certain resources that are important. Some resources are more important than others. Trust me, Forest 27 for Osaka residents is a major priority. We are supposed to protect it because we, we don't have an alternative forest to give us the ecosystem services that Forest 27 is currently giving us. So let's all play a role. Then, in our own lives as individuals, let's also try to live sustainable lifestyles. Let's try and reduce our carbon footprints. As individuals, we can do it. It doesn't make sense for us to care about the long life of trees, the well-being of river systems, but we do not care about increasing our own lifespans. What logic is there in that? We reduce our lifespans through unsustainable lifestyles, but we're busy promoting for the protection of everything else around us. No. First, let us increase our own lifespans by living sustainable lives. Let's come together as communities to make a difference in each other's lives and in the protection of our natural resources. Mr. P, we'd like to thank you very much for your time. We've been speaking to Mr. Timothy Kamuzuki, who is Executive Director of Amizu Eco Care, and is a former lecturer of Ecology, Environmental Education in the School of Education at the University of Zambia. And we've been looking at how you and I can help in combating the high deforestation rate. You're listening to ZNBC Radio 2, and the time is now 7.55. This time check is brought to you by